Well, hello everybody and welcome to part two of uh, our uh, series here on this amplifier kit. Um, as you can see it's all finished and assembled. The, uh, the, the, res the 39k resistors that I need came in really quickly. I was really shocked. I didn't expect them to come in this soon. And uh, so I fitted them in and uh, slowly brought the amp up and everything works perfectly. So uh, it's all assembled and as you can see we have the two magic eye tubes in here. We have our uh, output tubes. We have the transformers. You saw all this. It's all wired up. We're actually ready to put the cover on the top here um, which I may do pretty soon because there's some pretty uh, high voltages <laughs> floating around on there even though I have some of the terminals uh, insulated it's still you can get in there and get across those and I don't think that would be a lot of fun so um, as I said what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do some tests I'm gonna we're gonna look at a few different things of how this thing performs and then we're going to look at the schematic and kind of discuss a few things that we can do maybe to improve on the circuit or maybe if there's some things that maybe need improved on the circuit and uh, we'll go from there. So first of all let's uh, start out with uh, what I have in here right now. The first thing we did was I put a one kilohertz sine wave and uh, I'm just feeding it right into the input terminals like like we normally do. We're connected to our 8 ohm dummy load and uh, the first thing I'll tell you I don't like is this has again has one of those one of those stepped knobs. It's just a volume pot, one of those cheap ones and it has the detents in it and I hate those detents. I just hate them. You can't adjust it properly. I think detented knobs are the worst things ever to come out. <laughs> um, if it's a stepped attenuator there's a reason for the detents. It's because in a stepped attenuator you actually have uh, fixed resistors that are specifically chosen, their values are specifically chosen uh, to increase the volume at a certain slope. And with a pot, a potentiometer, it's a linear adjustment, you know, an analog, non-digital non adjustment. And those little, those little detents they put in there uh, make it very difficult to adjust the pot. Sometimes those detents, especially with a logarithmic potentiometer, can really throw things off. So first thing that's going to have to go is that. But anyway, let's take a look at what it looks like with the one kilohertz sine wave. We've got the scope hooked up. And I have uh, I have it set to measure RMS. Now, the chance this really cheap oscilloscope that I use I use it only for videos like this because it's not really a high resolution scope, um, but it gets the point across for us. So you can see the channel is noisy. Some of it has to do with the wiring. Some of it has to do with the actual scope itself. But it works. So ignore that little bit of noise. That's not the amplifier. That's just noise coming out of the scope itself and the wiring. So if we go up here we can see how nice and again this is see that just one click of the detent when you get onto that portion of the pot you can see how much it jumps and that's why I don't like it. But you can see right there it's just barely starting to clip a little bit and we have just around 10 volts uh, RMS. Okay, so if you see 10.0 here, 9.94 here, and again, some of these zigzaggy things is not distortion. It actually is just the res poor resolution of the scope. So we have almost exactly 10 volts before we really get into clipping. So if you do the math on that, into an 8 ohm load you're right around 12 and a half watts so this thing's rated at 13 watts um, and I believe it um, this is more like a 12 watt amplifier I do think as these tubes break burn in a little bit more and, and tweak out a little bit more I think you may get a little more out of it but it's safe to say that this is very cleanly 12 watts per channel. 
Now, if we switch from a sine wave to a square wave, uh, as you all know, we're on a square wave now. As you all know, square waves, output transformers notoriously do not like square waves um, because of the way a transformer works. But these have some pretty big iron in them for what they are, and these, I'm finding out, are exceptionally good quality for a low-cost transformer. So let's see what this thing does with a square wave, 1 kilohertz. And zoom you in a little bit. And you can see you get a wee little tiny bit of some oscillation. Again, a lot of that is not, no, not oscillation in the amp, but actually is in my test equipment. But as you can see, it handles square waves very well. And you can see we've got about 7, seven volts RMS. And I can go up pretty high. There's your, ten, there's your 12 watts. And it's still holding pretty flat square wave. So, again, transformers are working very well. Now, if I go back to, 20, to uh, sine wave, and let's drop our frequency all the way down to, let's say, 25 hertz. That's a pretty low frequency, I'd say. And I'll have to adjust my scope so that we can see it. Hold on, this scope has a terrible refresh rate. Let me bring it up a little bit. There we go. And you can see it at 25 hertz, it starts to distort just a little bit. Okay, so anyway, um, you can see we're, we're right, right around the 11 watt range, somewhere around there. And you can see it, there is some distortion of the sine wave, but you can clearly see that it is, it is going all the way down there. And at 30 hertz, uh, when we move to 30 hertz, it actually cleans up very very well so the frequency response on this thing is unbelievable um, let's go up to 20 kilohertz uh, and uh, gotta adjust the scope again let's open it up a little bit there we go there's 20 kilohertz clean as can be and once again, I mean, no problem getting that 12 and a half watts per channel. No oscillations, no distortion. It's just 20 kilohertz like nothing. So the bandwidth of this amplifier is fantastic. I mean, it really, I'm really impressed. Um, now, if you take a look down here, a couple of things that I noticed. Uh, you can see... Uh, the magic eye tubes work very well. The problem is these are not VU meters. If they were VU meters, it would they would show a function of the input signal. But really these are actually looking at the output, like your your actual power. They're more they're more like a power meter than they are a VU meter. So what that means is if you want them to deflect well and to make pretty pictures, <laughs> you have to run the amp just at whatever, whatever power level that you adjust it. There, are, there is an individual pot, gain pot for each one of these, and you can balance these. And all, I, and all you do is you just put a, just a, like a sine wave, like a 1 kilohertz tone into it, and you can set the deflection of them where you want them to be so they match. But you just have to remember, at low power, they'll hardly move at all. At high power, they'll just pinch shut. And at medium power, wherever you set it, they'll, they'll have some nice deflection and they'll make some nice eye candy. Uh, but really, they're, they're more, they're, it's, it's more of a novelty than anything else. Uh, there's no scale on them, anything like that. It's just really there to catch your eye. And I do think it looks nice. I think it's cool. I, like the, I just like those magic eye tubes. I think they're cool. Uh, 
as far as these tubes are concerned, I did a little more research on them. Uh, again, I, I can't tell for sure. I believe these may, there's a possibility they're Russian uh, 6P14s, but they also could be a Chinese knockoff. I don't know. Uh, certain, one thing about some of the, the, the authentic 6P14 tubes is they have a little more similarity to a 7189 tube than they do a 6BQ5 EL84 in that they can actually handle higher plate voltages than a standard 6BQ5 or EL84. Uh, especially the modern reproduction tubes that are out there. Uh, so they're actually a pretty stout tube. Now that being said, if these are really cheap Chinese tubes, I don't know. I, you see for yourself how they performed in this amp. Um, I did briefly, very briefly, connect it up to speakers and listen to it. It was the amplifier has some shortcomings with tonal quality, in my opinion, and it really isn't the amplifier. I think the amplifier they executed the design very well. It's the front end of the amp that has some issues, and we're going to look at that here in a little bit. So. Uh, with that being said, I just wanted to show you the transformers and everything. I'm going to put the top on this thing now so that this is all shielded. Uh, when I turn the volume down, even if I connect speakers, I can put my ear right against the speaker. There is absolutely no hum and there's no hiss. Uh, again, it has some things to do with the, the design of the amp and I'll show that to you. Um, but really very well uh, designed amp. I'm, I couldn't be more pleased for the price. Um, obviously you can get many many hundreds and even into the thousands of dollars for a vacuum tube amplifier these days and for the three hundred dollars or so roughly US that this cost shipping included uh, to me that's that's a real deal. I mean it came with really good quality transformers a nice chassis FR4 circuit board instead of the cheap, you know, <laughs> uh, cheap kind of board that, that you see, uh, the phenolic type. Uh, it has, it came with vacuum tubes, and it seems that the tubes that it came with are not bad. Uh, the, the capacitors were good quality. The components were, I did not, other than those couple parts that were missing, which were resistors, I used all the actual and those two those two capacitors because of the size of them not because they were poor quality with the exception of that I used all the stock parts that came with the kit so if you purchase one of these kits yes you may have to drill some holes you may have to change some things like I did for the transformers and so forth uh, you may want to use your own wire if you have better quality hookup wire even though it came with the appropriate wire um, I just liked the kind of wire I had had a little heavier insulation, a little better uh, insulated, better quality coating on it, you know, uh, heat resistant and so forth. That's the only reason I used it. But other than that, this is what you will be able to build. Right now, I have to say I recommend it. I, I recommend it with two thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> we're going to look at some design things that I think could be improved upon and that we might improve upon. Uh, again, they're minor things in my opinion, but uh, let's flip this thing over and let's take a look. All right, so looking at the amp from the underneath here, uh, right here in the front is the potentiometer board. This is where the loudness contour circuitry and the volume pot is located. Uh, Right next to it is our little power switch, and over here is another tiny little circuit board that just contains the actual loudness switch itself plus the associated wires that go with it. Uh, comes out of the volume board and it goes into these two little plugs. You can see one here and the other one's like underneath, you can't see it. And those are your inputs. Uh, Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to this here in a minute after we do a little nickel tour of the amp. Uh, negative feedback wires are right here and they just kind of lead back and they attach to the output board that I'll show you here in a minute. 
Um, you have two little potentiometers. You have one here and you have one right here. And those are connected directly to the uh, output of the output transformer. It actually kind of comes off of this negative feedback line. And that's where it monitors. These actually set up the signal that goes into those little, uh, the, six, the 6E2 uh, magic eye tubes. So this is actually like an attenuator pot. And this is, and that's why I said it, the, these, they're more like a power meter than they are, and they're not representative of watts or anything. But the higher you turn the volume, the more those will deflect, and this adjusts that range where you want them to deflect, if that makes sense. Uh, you can see how much filtration is in this thing. If we move back to the power supply section, there is a whole bunch of capacitance for just a little 10 watt per 12 watt per channel amplifier. So I was really impressed with that. Uh, these main diodes here are for your high voltage and then these uh, these little Zener diodes right here are for the screen voltage and for the preamp uh, power supply. Um, these big capacitors are bypassed with little uh, with these little film capacitors. So I mean they did everything right. It, it is really well designed. And if I go back to here, this is your impedance switching board. So this has a switch on it. It has the 4 ohm and the 8 ohm taps from both of the output transformers. Then it comes out of this board and it goes on to your two speaker terminals. So there's very short lead length which is great. Uh, the input terminal board is here, so there's your RCA inputs, and it goes across on this shielded wire to the front to the volume control board. So that's pretty much how this thing's put together. Now again, another option if you wanted to is instead of using these terminals, you could actually hard solder the wires directly onto the boards. Um, I chose not to do that. I was thinking about it, but to be honest, in x-ray machines, all the interface boards and everything are loaded with these exact same connectors, same manufacturer, same ones. And I've been working with them for 30 plus years and I have not ever had a problem with them. They, they lock down pretty good. They don't come loose. Uh, I just don't see any, any reason to worry about it. So I decided to use them. Um, if I ever have a problem like that, it's easy enough to remove those. The power supply even, they even thought of, they have two red LEDs, one here and one here, and those actually monitor the two, the two high voltage supplies for the 300 and the 350, I believe it is, and they light up to tell you, number one, that the, that the power is there, and number two, they stay on as long as the capacitors are charged, which is a really nice little thing to have. Uh, these are some weird LEDs. They don't match the ones in the assembly manual. They're perfectly square and they have absolutely no markings whatsoever on them. There's no flat spot, there's no notch, there's nothing. All there was was one lead longer than the other. So really you had to kind of measure it with a, you know, with your uh, diode check meter to see what the anode and cathode was. In this case, the cathode was the long the long lead but uh, you know most diodes have a marking these don't they're just perfectly flat square all the way around anyway there it is uh, it's a beautiful little amp and it works really well so now let's look at the schematic and I'll show you a couple concerns that I have that I found okay this first uh, this first schematic that I'm going to show you, and the, the, we're going to use the schematics that came with the amplifier, not the ones that came with the printout that they emailed me. Uh, although they're very similar, almost identical, but we'll use these because this is what you're going to get. This first schematic just shows the both amplifiers, both left and right channels, as well as the... Uh, no, it would help if I wasn't upside down <laughs> looking through the camera. <laughs> Holy crap. Uh, the 6E2 uh, Magic Eye Tubes. And so you can see 
one channel and the other channel and then when you flip it over they they just show you kind of a close-up view of the amplifier one channel itself and it kind of cuts off here the rest of it so this just makes it a little easier to see so let's look at this one first of all well let's let's flip here for a minute uh, as you can see it's a stand very standard amplifier uh, we'll get into the, comp the parts here in a minute and you come out of the output transformer you go through those little blue adjustment trimmer pots that I showed you and then that's what sets up your signal which drives the uh, the magic eye tube so that's the magic eye socket right or circuit right there no problem now getting on to the amplifier uh, simple push-pull design uh, instead of using a dropping a screen dropping resistor here like a like a, a grid stopper resistor that they would use which would normally be you know somewhere around 1k to 4k any you know depending on how close you want to bring this to your anode voltage they actually used a fixed regulated power supply which is that 300 volt regulated supply to drive your screens here so those will stay locked in at a fixed voltage regardless of what the tube is doing and then they just use the traditional 350 volt unregulated power supply to drive the anodes they you they tie the cathodes together and as you can see this is a cathode bias design it is not fixed bias and they use a shared cathode resistor and it's 150 ohms at 5 watts so it's a pretty nice hefty resistor and then they bypass it with those 220 microfarad capacitors so those ones that I replaced um, that are 220 microfarads at 25 volts the ones I put the niche cons that's what we replaced uh, that they originally came with the axial capacitors uh, and those are audio grade that I put in there for what it's worth <laughs> um, and by the way there is something to the audio grade thing uh, there's a couple things th you know that they do a little bit different it doesn't make a huge difference but on the like the KT series that you saw me use just now those blue ones all they're saying is that they just have a they'll they'll work at audio frequencies and they'll maintain their capacitance throughout those that range of frequencies a little bit better than some other capacitors might a lot of capacitors will work very well at 60 Hertz let's say you know line free or 120 Hertz um, but when you start getting up to audio frequencies they sometimes the capacitance can taper off rather quickly audio grade caps are designed to handle that a little better and then if you go to the next step up which would be like the gold the the kg series or the fg series i'm sorry the fine gold uh, or muse series capacitors by nichicon those ones actually even have some mechanical dampening inside the capacitor uh, to make them less uh, susceptible to, to noise you know mechanical vibration noise in the circuitry again I don't know how much of that is hogwash you know <laughs> snake oil but I do think there is at least some kernel of truth to it and it does you know if you're looking for the very best uh, performance that uh, you know the that would be it so anyway that's enough about that um, you have your grid stoppers here and they're 1k so this is a very very traditional design for a push-pull uh, pentode type EL84 amplifier uh, it's using a cathodyne or uh, concertina style whichever you want to call it uh, phase splitter uh, cathodynes are nice they're a simple design and they only have simple problems so uh, once again the only one of the big drawbacks of a cathodyne is that you can't really put any introduce any kind of gain into this stage it it is strictly for phase splitting only so uh, don't expect this to have any gain if you try to do it it won't work right um, it is pretty stable and it, if as long as you bias it correctly now 
if you look, they're only using a 39K on each side, uh, you know, for your voltage divider. And these actually run pretty warm. Uh, now, again, it part of this is because these are not 12AX7s. They are not 12AU7s. They are, and they're not ECC85s either. They're ECC88s, which is a 6DJ8 type tube. Um, they are kind of unique when you compare them to like a 12AX7. So some of the, the, the Miller capacitance and cer certain characteristics of these tubes are different from a 12AX7. They're also lower gain than a 12AX7, but also because of the lower gain, they tend to have lower noise. Um, so anyway, that, that dictates how they did this. Uh, traditional decoupling capacitors here, they're using uh, 0.22 microfarads or 220 nanofarads. Uh, they are direct coupling the input of that cathodyne to the output of your preamp. So if you look there, there's no decoupling capacitor and there is absolutely no grid stopper here either. Now, on these 6DJ8s, you can get away with that and it works very well. Um, so there's no problem with this. Where things start getting weird is over here, this looks good so far. I mean, you have your input grid, so this is the input to the amplifier. Uh, you're using a, they're using a grid leak resistor of 470k. Uh, a lot of what I've seen and read about 6DJ8 or ECC88s, they tend to like to have a much higher uh, grid leak resistor. So you can have this up in the 10 to 20 mega ohm range but uh, 470k will work again uh, grid leak resistors and yes grid leak is kind of a misnomer too but that's kind of the the term that everybody uses and uh, essentially it just gives this thing a ground reference so that this doesn't float up and possibly go positive or you know something like that and mess up the biasing of the of the tube but if you notice, we are missing a grid stopper resistor. There is no grid stopper. What is a grid stopper? Well, it's a resistor that's placed in front of the grid here, usually physically soldered very close to the tube. And its purpose is, couple. it, it, does, it affects the tube in a couple of ways. Number one, it will kind of act as a voltage divider between the grid and the grid leak, and it will suppress any of the stray Miller capacitance and if you want to know a little more about Miller capacitance look it up uh, there's a lot of good articles on it but essentially these tubes can can go kind of into parasitic oscillation at very high frequencies and that grid stopper resistor will help to reduce that the hot the other thing that, that the grid stopper will do is it will limit because of that it will also limit the high frequency a little bit it'll attenuate it so if you put a real high value of grid stopper resistor it will tend to give this a little warmer sound and make it not as harsh however when you put a great big grid stopper in there it will also cause the amp to you can get that hiss sound in the background um, so when the amps at no volume and you're in a quiet room, your speakers, especially the tweeters of your speakers, you, you'll hear like sometimes a hiss. So there's kind of a trade-off on that, and you kind of have to experiment with the grid stopper resistor to add one. But right there is something that I may want to do is like add anywhere from a 300 to a 1 kilo ohm resistor. And one of the things I was thinking of possibly doing was taking some of those, uh, let's see where they are. We have these little surface mount resistors. They're 1K ohm or 1000 ohm uh, left over from, I didn't put those LEDs in the tube sockets to make the fake filament light. So what I may do is I may cut the track right next to the input uh, of the grid here, like the pin two, and just bridge this resistor right across the track there, right at the tube socket and add a grid stopper to it. I'm um, just thinking about that right now. 
so far this is all very good and I'm and you can see how well this works um, being that it's cathode biased it's very forgiving uh, you know especially when it comes to tube matching and things like that this is a very forgiving design uh, so it's not like a fixed bias where you have to uh, apply a voltage to the grids and all that negative voltage it's just kind of finds its own happy spot and that's affected by the value of this resistor right here so uh, yeah they picked good numbers and they picked good components and as you saw it worked very very well now let's go to the next part this is where I think they could have done a little better this is the input board and what you see here is this switch right here SK that's that switch that for the loudness contour so loudness contour is supposed to enhance the low frequencies at low volume and kind of suppress the high frequencies at low volume and then as you turn the potentiometer up there's a tap there's actually a center tap in the in the, the pot in the volume pot and when you when the wiper of the pot gets past that center tap it will actually and you can see the center taps right here it actually will decrease the influence of that loudness control so it's supposed to just make the amp sound better at low volumes uh, and that's all well and good to put that in there but where I have the problem is the way they inserted the volume control in here um, if you remember from our schematic we have our grid leak and it's 470 K or 470,000 ohms and then they turned around and they put the pot this pot right here is a 50k pot and if you turn the volume all the way up maximum volume you're essentially taking this wiper and you're moving it up here so you're going to have between ground and the input here's your input jack you're going to have 50k or 50,000 ohms so you have a 50k and this pin 1 here attaches to pin 1 right here and as you can see we're essentially putting 50 a 50k resistor in parallel with this 470k grid leak so you pretty much take this out of the circuit and it defeats the purpose of it the other problem that I really have now is when you turn this pot all the way down you are essentially pulling this grid directly to ground which typically is not a good thing to fully ground the grid you should always have some sort of you know resistance in there this is extremely high impedance normally and we're basically turning this into a lower impedance circuit by shunting this pot across here this way so I'm not really impressed with this I think it would be better if we eliminated this whole board and took your RCA jack and went straight into here and just go through like a 300 ohm or a 1k ohm grid stopper right here and eliminate the volume altogether. Then I don't have to deal with that horrible cheap detented pot that's in there that's very low quality and we don't have any of this tainting our sound. The grid stopper will probably give us a nice little attenuation of the high frequencies and it will allow this to stay open like this um, bottom line is they did this because we live in the modern times that we live in right now most people want to take their mp3 player or their cell phone or whatever come out of the headphone jack and plug right into this and just use this as as a full amplifier with no no preamp at all so without a preamp you don't have a volume control you don't have a bass and treble control so they tried to do a poor man's preamp <laughs> by uh, just putting a pot and a uh, kind of a makeshift loudness contour switch on the front end of this amp and eliminate the need for a preamp and in doing so they kind of messed up the design of this amp you're much better off and and I will tell you if you plug an mp3 player directly into this circuit like this it won't sound very good because 
there just isn't enough of a drive signal coming out of an MP3 player or sometimes even of a cell phone for that matter to really drive this amp uh, the way it needs to be driven. So you really should have some sort of preamp uh, between your MP3 player and the input of this amp. That's the proper way to do it. Um, so now you see kind of what I'm thinking about that maybe I may make that modification down the road. But for right now, if you turn this volume up to maximum, turn it all the way up, and then connect your preamp to it, you're still, this is going to be less than 50k uh, of grid leak. However, you know, it, it'll work because a, a transistor or a solid state preamp is, a, you know, going to be a little bit lower impedance than a vacuum tube preamp anyway. So, once again, uh, we're going to try that and see how it works and just eliminate the use of the pot altogether just by turning it to maximum and leaving it there. If it sounds good, I'll leave it as is. If it doesn't sound good, I'll eliminate this board and we'll do it like that. So that being said, let's put the, the bottom on this thing, finish putting it together, and maybe we'll do a little listening test. Uh, at least the best I can here. We'll try to rig something up so we can hear it. Okay, we're using the front-facing camera mics, and I got, uh, got a song queued up. I can't play it for very long because I don't want to get the copyright thing, but it'll get you the idea of how this sounds. Now again, I'm using my cell phone, which has a lot higher output than my MP3 player, but this is still not going to sound nearly as good as it will with an actual real preamp. So uh, again, this thing will perform very well with a preamp and a nice big set of speakers, but this will give you the, give you the idea anyway. Here we go. Another song. So it kind of gives you the idea of how it sounds. Um, but I'll tell you, this thing is really impressive. Um, I really like it. So uh, let me uh, show you one last thing here and we'll get this video wrapped up. Okay, some of you were asking on the last video where to order one of these if you want to get one. So uh, here is the main store on eBay that sells it right here and this is what you want to type into the search bar um, if you want to search for it again there are several vendors that are selling these at any given moment uh, it changes from <laughs> month to month or week to week but if you want to look on eBay here it is right here uh, another the other option is you can get these once again from AliExpress and there it is and if you order from AliExpress they have different pricing on it uh, anywhere from here $249 US uh, to $217 with a $70 shipping and that's going to give you about $286 um, shipped to the US. I'm sure the pricing will vary based on what country you're in. And uh, once again, it's a 6P14 push pull class AB tube integrated amplifier DIY kit, 13 plus 13 watts. So those are the two places you can find them. And uh, again, I have to recommend this thing. It sounds really good. And the more you, the more I play this amp. Uh, the better it sounds. I mean, these tubes are starting to burn in a little bit, and the bass is getting a little bit better sounding and so forth. So, uh, again, it's working really well. So, uh, I hope you like this little video. Uh, I know I enjoyed building it. It only, I mean, even if you are new to kit building, it's not a super complicated uh, build. 
So that's all good news. And uh, till next time, thank you all once again. Uh, I got a lot of good comments on this little project here on the first video. So uh, until next time, I wish you all peace and happiness in your lives. And I wish you all the best. And I got to get back to work. I got a lot of things to do here. So uh, I'll leave you with this.